All right, I want to invite you to turn to Micah chapter 6. In our series in Isaiah, we've come to chapters 58 and 59, which address issues related to biblical justice. Uh, chapter 58 of Isaiah is one of the great chapters on biblical justice in all of Scripture. Today, in Micah 6, I wanted to share some foundational truths that will help us to think rightly about the biblical teaching on justice. One of my favorite novels is the classic 1960 novel by Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, which explores the theme of justice in a small town in Alabama. There's a black man named Tom Robinson who is accused of a crime that he did not commit. And Atticus Finch, you want to talk about uh, an example as a dad, we've got some Atticus Finch type dads in this church and I love it. Atticus Finch is the lawyer who is appointed to defend him. Uh, the town is irate that anyone would seek to defend Tom, but Atticus proves to be a model of integrity and justice. The story, many of you know, addresses the perennial injustices of prejudice and racism, uh, false accusations, lying, uh, a flawed criminal justice system, sexual assault, violence, and murder. Uh, Atticus Finch has a six-year-old daughter named Scout who doesn't understand how the actions of her father can be right when nearly everyone in the town is against him and thinks Atticus is in the wrong. At one point, Atticus says to her, to his daughter, he says, I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. He knows his worship would be hypocrisy. You cannot worship the God of justice without doing justice in everyday life. When Atticus is then pressed on the idea that he must be wrong because so many disagree with him and are opposed to his actions, Atticus says, before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. Justice is not concerned with pleasing the majority. It is concerned to do what is right in the sight of God. Atticus says the determining factor in his conduct will not be what others think of him, but whether or not he is doing what is just with a clear conscience before the Lord whom he worships. Our title today is A Passion for Biblical Justice. Micah chapter 6, we'll read verses 6 through 8. This is God's holy and authoritative word. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? May God bless the preaching of his word. Those two first verses that we just read, verses 6 and 7, present a series of questions about the nature of a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. We ask, all of us, with what shall we come before the Lord? What will be pleasing in his sight? And the prophet Micah brings this challenging message that God is not interested in our worship when it's not backed up with righteous living. You can have, he says, the towering sacrifice of thousands of rams, countless flowing rivers of oil. You can have all of the church attendance and singing and praying in the world, but, the prophet says, religious sacrifice divorced from ethics is an abomination to the Lord. 
In verse 8, the prophet then summarizes the covenant requirements of the Lord. This is how the redeemed must live. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The best and most costly sacrifice, the offering that we can bring to the Lord is a life of doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with our God. Doing justice refers to the proper treatment of others according to God's standards of righteousness. It means giving others their due as those made in the image of God. The call to do justice is not limited to kings and judges. It is required of all of God's people in all of life. And I want to tell you, for Covenant Fellowship, for our church family, I see so much at stake in our understanding of justice. This matters profoundly for the health of our church family and the reputation of our Savior. Justice is a hot topic culturally, and there is good reason to be concerned about the ways some Christians and Christian leaders are engaging the subject. Here's what you have. On the one hand, some people who recognize the dangers of the social gospel have adopted what could only be described as a posture of suspicion toward justice, especially justice in the public sphere, toward issues like racism and oppression. Rather than cultivate a passion for justice, there's a tendency among some to minimize the breadth of biblical teaching on justice. Too many Christians fail to understand the devastation caused by injustice, the full and lasting impact that it has on individuals, how injustice plagues the structures of society, how past injustices have an effect on future generations. They tend to see issues of justice as distractions from the gospel and threats to the gospel rather than necessary entailments of the gospel. That's on the one hand. Then on the other hand, a growing number of people are uncritically embracing the culture's approach to justice. They are passionate about justice but tend to be lacking the requisite theology of justice and the biblical discernment to inform and sustain that passion. They are in danger of distorting the mission of the church, displacing the centrality of Christ and Him crucified. There's at times, in fact, on this side of things, a tendency to focus this passion for justice on others, uh, pointing fingers self-righteously rather than prioritizing our own righteousness and justice. In their zeal for justice, some have in fact done great damage standing in sinful judgment over others and destroying their reputation in the name of justice. Last year, there was a fascinating story on NPR. It begins by saying, we live in times of instant mass outrage. Someone does something, says something, or is seen doing something, and they can be demonized with a click. The article goes on to share that an incident during a baseball game between the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, the Cubs' first base coach tossed a foul ball to a smiling young boy. He bobbled the baseball, and it was retrieved then by a man who sat behind the boy, and the man gave it to the woman next to him. The article goes on to say, tweets and other social media posts began a barrage about the man who filched a foul ball from a little boy. However, what the Cubs discovered from people nearby was that the man in question wound up with four balls during the game and gave three to children, including the young man who had appeared to be swindled. He also gave one to his wife. It was their anniversary. A spokesperson for the Cubs said in a statement, a video that was quickly posted and unverified has unfortunately made a national villain out of an innocent man. My own Twitter feed at this time was lighting up with people outraged over this particular incident. The author of that article says, I almost retweeted that 12-second video myself, no doubt with some caustic comment. He said, I think I would have if the man had been a Yankees fan. <laughs> it sounds fair enough. And then the article ends with, with this commentary on the pursuit of justice. This is the closing line of that 
article, how many of us today would rather be outraged than informed? How many of us today would rather be outraged than informed? This world's pursuit of justice majors on outrage and minors on being reformed, on being informed. And that is a massive problem for anyone who cares about biblical justice. It is a sad and bitter irony that those who are most outspoken about justice have so often become the ones who are most guilty of perpetuating grave injustices through reckless accusations and harsh judgments and a devastating failure to protect the reputation of others as we are. We are, friends, we are living in a day in which the church of Christ, the people of God, has exchanged its birthright of justice by due process for the pottage of trial by internet, and it is a travesty. And so, as we seek to cultivate a passion for doing justice, we must be informed. We must be informed as to what God's word says about the nature of justice and how to do justice. We must apply theological discernment to matters of justice. We must process these things not through cultural and political categories, but biblically. As we engage the urgent task of pursuing justice in a manner that is pleasing to God. I want to consider justice under three headings in the remainder of the time we have here. So these headings will be the word of God, the centrality of the gospel, and the witness of the church. And then in the weeks to follow from Isaiah 58 and 59, we'll hear more related to these themes of justice. First point, justice and the word of God. The biblical teaching on justice, all right, Micah 6, those verses we read is quite a familiar passage. We ought to know the biblical teaching on justice is not confined to that familiar passage or even to the book of Isaiah and what we've seen in that book and will see in that book. Justice, along with kindness in the text, is first and foremost a quality of the nature of God. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, the rock, his way is perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. And Psalm 89, 14, we saw earlier, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Charles Octavius Booth, the, uh, the African-American Baptist preacher who was born into slavery, writing in the 1800s, says this. He says, holiness is the rectitude of divine character, and justice is the rectitude of the divine government. Our God is holy and just. And the starting point for defining justice has to be the character of God, knowing the blazing perfection of the justice of a holy God will guard sinful people like you and me from the mistake of thinking that we are essentially people of justice. See, most of us, if you read Micah 6, 8, right, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly, we tend to be aware that we regularly fall short in humility, right? We can all probably think of instances this past week where we failed to be as humble as we are. We know we often fall short in kindness, some of us can think over the past 24 hours ways that we have sinned by failing to be kind in our tone, in our speech, in our treatment of others. We tend, however, to be far less aware of our shortcomings in the realm of justice. In fact, there are more than a few American Christians today who would say that what Israel so repeatedly failed to do in the realm of justice all these rebukes and reproofs of the people of God and their failures of justice, what the people of God, they would say, failed to do in Isaiah's day is what America eventually achieved. While Israel as a nation was often rebuked by God for their many injustices, America, they say, has become a nation in which justice reigns 
and oppression and injustice are kept to a minimum. And the reason so many people think that way is that our understanding of justice is shaped more by American ideals than by the word of God. I don't think that we should deny progress. We ought to be grateful for the many blessings that we enjoy. But how can we who know and worship the God of all justice possibly view America or any nation as a paragon of justice and righteousness? Here's an important question. Think about this with me, okay? What kind of gap do you think exists between God's justice and ours? And I'm giving you a hint through my hands here. My question isn't, what kind of gap do you think exists between God's justice and ours? What kind of gap do you think exists between God's justice and ours? It is a massive gap. R.C. Sproul, in his book, The Holiness of God, lays out an absolutely stunning vision of the holy justice of God. And he says that one of the ways that God is transcendentally separate from us is that he is a God of justice, whereas our lives are full of injustices. The human capacity for injustice is not confined to the courtroom or to legislation. Sproul says in The Holiness of God, this is a quote, every one of us at some time has been a victim of injustice at the hands of another person. Every one of us at some time has committed an injustice against another person. People treat each other unfairly. So we want to get rid of the idea that as long as you haven't bribed anyone or stolen someone's ox or whatever, that you are therefore perfectly following the biblical command to do justice. Herman Bavink says that justice is the constant and perpetual desire to grant every person his or her due. John Perkins observes that justice in Scripture involves a public or social component that moves people in a community toward mutual concern and toward development both individually and collectively. So to walk the the path of justice biblically, it's not enough to refrain from evil. We must also positively treat others rightly. We must help the weak and lift up the vulnerable, give to the needy, show mercy and kindness, treat others as you want to be treated, practice biblical speech ethics, value due process, resist greed, work faithfully, walk in generosity. This is the biblical teaching on what justice is. Second heading, justice and the centrality of the gospel. The command to do justice in Micah 6, 8 is grounded in the reality, gloriously, of God's redeeming love, which is in verse 4. Look a few verses earlier, Micah 6, verse 4. The Lord says, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And it's then following that, that we are called to seek justice, to do justice, to live lives of justice. In other words, our pursuit of justice is a response to God's pursuit of us in Christ. Here's a question. I want you to think about this. How can we maintain the centrality of the gospel in the pursuit of justice? It's an important question that each one of us ought to consider because all it takes to be led away from the gospel is to have some other passion or message, even for a good thing, become the main thing. It should never be this way, but sadly, a concern for doing justice has led more than a few Christians and churches away from the message of the death and resurrection of Christ as the message of first importance. The problem, understand, is not that people care too much about justice. The solution is never to be less passionate about biblical justice. It is to be more passionate about the gospel in which the justice of God is made known. In the gospel, this God of justice has acted in his Son to uphold his justice and to declare sinners to be justified by grace alone. You and I are not a just people. Jesus Christ is the only perfectly just man who ever walked this earth. 
and he was unjustly put to death on a Roman cross for our sin. The cross is a declaration that God does not ignore the injustice and the sin of humanity. God put forward his son to be a propitiation by his blood, Romans 3, so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the gospel by which we have been saved. And we are aware, I want you to know this, we are aware as pastors that the stewardship that has been given to us by God is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and this gospel in all of its clarity and authority and glory. We are not captive to the demands of a media-saturated and social media-driven culture. Our job as pastors, my job, is not to voice our personal opinions on complex social issues. Twitter doesn't need my hot takes. The expertise of the pastor is not in political or economic theory or sociology or foreign policy. We are called by God to faithfully preach Christ crucified and to apply the word of God in all of its truth to our lives. <laughs> to, to maintain, there's a few things to keep in mind here as how we maintain the centrality of the gospel in the pursuit of justice. One thing is that we need to distinguish between a biblical vision of justice and a worldly vision of justice. And here's the test for that. If you can imagine a just society in which Christ does not reign in the hearts of the people. Okay, If you can imagine a just society in which people do not worship Christ as the king of justice and righteousness, then you have abandoned a distinctly Christian vision of justice. Because, I say this because you can have economic development, social freedom, political power, humanitarian relief, and still quite literally have a godless vision of justice. A vision of justice that is so shallow and superficial that it can be realized without ever restoring sinners to God. Yes, we believe in a cosmic redemption that will one day transform society and make all things new. But there is a secular vision of justice that fails to understand that the only way to give people the highest good and to meet their greatest need and to see true justice realized is to give them Christ. People need Christ and his gospel. So Jonathan Lehman says, this is a quote, Christians do justice by caring for the materially disenfranchised and the spiritually downtrodden in every way, physically, socially, emotionally. Yet we do justice, most of all, by pointing people to their judge and would-be redeemer and calling them to repent and believe. That is how we do justice, most of all. The gospel also makes all the difference in how we respond to injustice. And so if you want to maintain the centrality of the gospel, you need to apply it to where you have known injustices, especially where we are victims. You know the story of the Israelites, and we see this in Isaiah, is that they moved from being sorely oppressed in Egypt to then committing acts of oppression against the vulnerable after they were delivered. This principle is one that has often been pointed out, but apart from Christ, victims often become vindictive. It's the great lesson of Killmonger's character in Black Panther. Tim Keller says that only Christianity offers a justice that does not create new oppressors. And Cornelius Plantinga, the philosopher, explains that victims of injustice often victimize others. He says that victims are unlikely to exercise stern self-control because they feel entitled. And so therefore, those among us who are victims, those who have been mistreated, abused, slandered, sinned against, marginalized, persecuted, even as we grieve, and we do, even as we experience righteous anger, and we do, even as we cry out for justice, and we do, 
we must always remember the great potential and temptation to sin grievously against the Lord and to stray from the gospel of grace. One of the best ways to maintain the centrality of the gospel in our pursuit of justice is Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Friends, we need to remember that God is the only one who can ultimately settle accounts. He can ultimately settle accounts accurately, him and him alone. We need to remember that because otherwise we begin playing the part of God. People will mistreat you. People will speak against you. People will hurt you. And sadly, justice is often elusive in this present age. And so what do we do? Well, certainly we work for justice, but also we place our hope in the God of justice. That God is a God of justice means even as we work and pray for justice, even as we do our part and call on civil authority to do their necessary and God-given part, Christians know, you know, that at the end of the day, you are able to leave things in God's hands. Because Yes, people might escape justice in this life, but they cannot escape final justice. God is a God of justice. Have you ever thought about this? For me, the doctrine of hell completely changes the way I think about injustice. God will repay. And so when we suffer unjustly, we are able, 1 Peter 2 says, to entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. Look, God God is far more passionate about justice than any of us. And we must learn to set our hope fully in the justice he will bring and work for us at the return of Christ. Maintain the centrality of the gospel in your pursuit of justice. The third and last heading, justice and the witness of the church. Under this last heading, what I want to highlight is that being a people of justice and righteousness, and mercy is an important way, is really an essential way that we let our light shine before the world. Doing justice reveals the character of God. It demonstrates what it means to be a Christian, and often it wins a hearing for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. An understanding of biblical justice matters for every member of Covenant Fellowship because this is how we adorn the gospel we proclaim. If our minds and hearts as Christians are not tuned to the mind and heart of God in his concern for justice, we won't be able to care for others as we ought, nor will we represent Christ as we ought. Think about just some of what's at stake. Will we have an impulse of empathy and action for those who are marginalized and victimized and falsely accused? Will those in positions of power shun every authoritarian impulse in our hearts and in our leadership? That's a matter of justice. Will we open our mouths for the rights of those who are destitute and defend the rights of the poor and needy, including the unborn? Will we actively pursue unity and friendships across ethnic lines? Will we listen and learn? And will ethnic minorities feel like they belong? Will we talk about authority and submission in a way that truly helps those who have only ever known the abuse of authority? Will we celebrate God's design for gender in a way that guards against the male dominance that has plagued so many cultures throughout our history? Will we understand the ways that authority and power can be misused and abused in the home? Will we teach the joys of sexual intimacy with genuine compassion and care for the many who are survivors of sexual assault? Will we value procedural justice And practice biblical speech ethics? Will we resist the temptation to spread slander and negative reports 
of others? Will we, as we have opportunity, care for the poor and the destitute, visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and lift up the needy? This is what it means, church family, to be a people of justice. It was part of the conversion of Charles Spurgeon that he not only came to love Christ as Savior, but also was given the heart of Christ for the victimized and the outcast in London. Um, We know Spurgeon as a great preacher and author, but do you know him as an advocate for justice? By the age of 50, Charles Spurgeon had started or been involved in starting over 60 social ministries, which he remained involved in to varying degrees. He founded two orphanages that provided for 500 boys and 500 girls. He spent Christmas Day at Stockwell Orphanage eating dinner with the children. He started a ministry for prostitutes. In in 1857, there were 8,600 prostitutes in his district. Massive mission field that he saw. There was a home for unmarried mothers, a nursing home, a poor fund, the book fund with his wife. The Ladies Benevolent Society made clothes for the poor. The Ladies Maternal Society served pregnant women among the London poor. The Flower Mission sent flowers to hospital patients. Hampton's Blind Mission was a Sunday school for blind children. There were soup kitchens, a pastor's college, and more. The life of Spurgeon was a life committed to combating injustice. And that made a profound impact in adorning the message of the gospel that rang out from Metropolitan Tabernacle. Researchers have recently learned how much Spurgeon was worth. So this is amazing that from 1870 to 1891, Spurgeon earned the equivalent of $26 million and was probably worth around $100 million over the course of his life. In New York City, his sermons were selling 1,000 copies a minute at trade shows. Spurgeon died relatively poor. The reason is that he funneled all of his resources into those 66 ministries in London, many of which he personally financed his whole life. It's hard to imagine anyone more gospel-centered than Charles Spurgeon was. He was, above all, a preacher of the cross of Christ. And it is precisely that passion for the gospel that led him to invest himself in the great social ills of his day, including his strong and unpopular stance against racial injustice. It is the gospel that instilled this passion for biblical justice. Now, the question that we need to ask is not whether we have the same resources or the same industry and zeal as Charles Spurgeon, this great man that he was. I can assure you the answer is that we do not. The question to ask is this. Is the God of Charles Spurgeon our God? Is the, is the saving grace of God that centered Charles Spurgeon on the gospel and motivated him to biblical justice... Does that belong to him alone, or are we too the recipients of that saving grace in our generation? Friends, let us press on to be a people of justice, knowing that as we live this way, we are a prophetic presence in a world of injustice, shining in the midst of the darkness and pointing to the future world of justice that Christ will bring. Because we know Brothers and sisters, I have said it before and I will say it again in the future. We know that because of Christ, injustice will not last forever. Injustice doesn't get the last word. Christ has the last word. And God has promised that all injustice will one day end. And therefore, as we press on in a world of injustice, we will not lose heart, for we know the plan and the purposes of God will prevail, and justice will roll down. The Messiah comes riding on a white horse full of power. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And justice will roll down. Those who perpetuate evil will be judged, the enemies of God will cower before him, and justice will roll down. 
The poor and the vulnerable will be protected. Partiality will be no more and justice will roll down. We will dwell with our God forever in a world of righteousness and peace and joy and justice will roll down. The Lamb of God who sits on the throne will make all things new. He will consummate his kingdom. It will be the end of sin and death and injustice. And in that day, justice will roll down like never before. Come, Lord Jesus. The Spirit and the bride say, come. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus, and justice will roll down. Amen.